Well, hello, everyone. I've got a question uh, from a student about this question in particular. It's uh, problem number one from section 5.5. Uh, the question just reads, to define the inverse sine function, we restrict the domain of sine to the interval, well, there, some interval. On this interval, the sine function is one to one, and its inverse function, sine inverse, is defined by sine inverse of x is y, if and only if sine of something is something else. So let me give you just an example of, of what this is. Um, and we'll go from there. So the sine function, from the unit circle perspective here, remember it always relates to the y coordinate for uh, a terminal point on the unit circle somewhere. So if I draw this angle here, that's this angle, we can call it t, then this terminal point on the unit circle has the coordinates x, y, right? But because this is the unit circle, we know that this x and this y have a certain form to them. The, the x coordinate is always the cosine of the angle t. The y coordinate is always the sine of the angle t. We always know that this pattern holds for a terminal point on the unit circle with a reference angle t here in the first quadrant. Uh, these can have negatives or positives uh, in front of them, depending on which quadrants they're in. Um, so I wanna just sort of give you this idea then, going back a few sections, that we have this, these two sets of numbers. We've got the domain which in our case is angles. And we also have something called the range for our functions, which are, well, these are values between one and negative one. Um, really they're ratios, which we'll get to next time, of sides of triangles. We'll get to that in the next chapter. Um, but the sine and cosine, as functions, they take angles and they take them to a ratio, a number between negative one and one. So if we have an X here or a T here, what we get out is something called the ratio, right? Um, so this question is really just asking us, uh, which angles are we allowed to do this on? Um, well, really you're allowed to do this on any angle. You can take the cosine or the sine of any angle you want. But in order to make sure that you have a one-to-one -one function, remember that the function needs to pass a, a certain test that we've learned before. So let me just sketch quickly a little bit of a sine graph to my best ability. Um, there it is. So there's this, this wonderful test, right? That test to see if a function is one to one. And it, what it means is for every one output, there's only one input that gives it. So let me just draw a random horizontal line here. And we'll notice that it touches in multiple places. Right there, right there, right here, right here. And it'll keep going on and on to the right and to the left. So this is not a one-to-one -one function. For this one output, this one height, we're getting lots of inputs that give that. So remember, we need to restrict ourselves. We need to restrict ourselves to uh, an interval of inputs and an interval of, of outputs here. So we, we have a, the outputs are restricted already to negative one and one. And the angle this, this can be done many ways. Um, the interval they use here is something, the standard interval. Uh, it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, we could pick an interval so long as there's uh, so long as there's no repeats, right? We could not choose this interval here from here to here. That would be zero to pi. 
for sine because we've we've still got a non one to one function. Um, we could choose pi over two to this angle, which is three pi over two. Right, so then we've got no repeats from here all the way down to here. We only hit each height once. But a much more standard way of doing this is in, instead of shifting over to the right, we just keep that interval centered on zero. So we use this interval of a negative pi over two angle up to pi over two. That way, the portion of the sign that we're using has no repeats in it. So that's, that's why they've got this um, on the first part. On the second part, on this interval, the sine function is one to one and its inverse function, sine inverse is defined as this. So here they're telling us the sine inverse of x equals y. So let's, let's think about sine inverse and, and, uh, and x and y here. Remember that the sine of an angle gives you a ratio. So if we took, for example, the sine of t, that will equal r. Well, what that means is that going backwards, that's what the inverse function does. That'll give us that the sine of a ratio, the sine inverse of that ratio gives us the angle back. So we just need to sort out what our angles are here and what are our uh, ratios. Well, we see here that y must be our angle because the sine inverse of something is that. So this must be that y and x then must be the ratio. So the, the correct answer here was definitely y because we've got that the sine of an angle is a ratio. It doesn't make sense to plug in a ratio into the sine function um, you can do that. It's, it's a number, but uh, from this interpretation of the sign taking an angle and sending it to a ratio, uh, that doesn't make much sense. You'd have to interpret the ratio as an angle. Okay, so for example, we've got this. Sine inverse of one half is pi over six. So let me, let me come over here and just draw in a pi over six angle to my best ability. So pi over six, let's see. That means we take this full angle of pi, right? And we divide it into six parts. So that looks like a third of a 90 degree angle, a third of a pi over two angle. So it's something like this. So pi over six. Okay. So what this is telling us is that the sine inverse of one half is pi over six. In other words, this height is one half. So we've got this ratio of one half and the sine of the angle pi over six is what gives us that. Sine of this angle is this ratio, one over two. Again, later we'll get to uh, what this is saying, but um, in the next chapter, I think that's, that's when we get to that. So this is, um, the next part is just to, to show that we have the same relationship uh, that we just talked about. We've got the sine inverse of one half equaling pi over six. Well, that means if we switch these two variables around, the sine of pi over six is one half. Right, that's the little piece of knowledge that we know, which helps us go backwards. So it, it's important to keep this sort of thing in mind, um, this stuff over here in mind, um, so that this this whole inverse stuff makes sense, right? So I hope that helps and answers your questions.